The Barker Cast presents a special feature for Barker Cast Halloween October. In part two, we have a special guest, author Peter Atkins, reading from his 2008 novel, Moon Town. Happy Halloween and enjoy. Hi, uh, this is Pete Atkins uh, for the Barker Cast. Happy Halloween. Uh, the lads have asked me to read a little something. So I uh, am going to read a little something, a Halloween themed little something. Uh, this is from my book, my novel, Moontown. Uh, actually, I should let you enjoy the Alan Clark artwork before I take the cover off. Uh, Alan Clark artwork, Dean of Warner Design, published by Earthling Publications. But I am of course gonna take the jacket off before reading because that's what civilized people do. Um, Let's have another look at Alan's uh, lovely artwork on the signature page as well. Um, so even though this is not a Rolling Darkness Review reading, um, I did bring along the Rolling Darkness Review shot glass. Uh, so from the Rolling Darkness Review, from me to the Barker cast, to all the children of the night and all the tribes of the moon, Slancher, happy Halloween. <clears throat> mm. Okay, so what I'm going to do is read a section. What background do you need before this? All you need to know is that the protagonist of the story, um, a young woman called Shelley, um, finds an old book that she'd forgotten, or tried to forget about, that she'd read when she was a little girl and finding it by surprise in a, in a bookshelf where she was fairly sure it hadn't been the day before triggers a memory. Um, maybe the memory of a dream, maybe the memory of something that actually happened. But anyway, I just, I'll pick up the section when we're with Shelley as a four-year-old with her mother uh, on Halloween night. <clears throat> Knockity knock, knock, knock. That's the sound they hear, Shelley and her mom. The sound of someone making a big production number out of knocking at their front door. Shelley doesn't like the sound and pretends not to hear it. She knows that it's late. She knows that it's dark outside and she doesn't want the door to be opened. Knockity knock, knock, knock. Shelley and her mom are watching TV. They're watching something mom likes. Mom likes really old movies, not just old really old. Not just movies from before there were colours in the world, but movies from back before people had learned to talk. This is called slapstick, Mom has said when they've watched similar things before. Slapstick. Shelley does not like the sound of that. She's a good girl and has never been spanked or slapped, but she bets it hurts more with a stick. The show they're watching now seems much meaner than the other ones Shelley has seen, as if this is what slapstick does when it thinks the teacher isn't looking. There were two men. One of them was big and one of them was little. They wore clothes that were baggy and dusty and their faces were very white as if they were dusty too. But the black lines around their eyes had hard, dark edges. They'd come back to see a butcher who had cheated them out of some money and they had done awful things to his shop and we're now setting about doing awful things to him. Aren't they silly? Mom says to Shelley, with the big happy smile she uses when she wants Shelley to believe something that isn't true. Shelley doesn't think the men are silly. She thinks the men are mean and crazy. And she watches disapprovingly as they feed the butcher who'd stolen their money into his own mincing machine, the littler one laughing silently as the sausages come out, while the larger one stares right out of the screen at them, winking and nodding, putting his thumb up in the air. Knockity knock, knock, knock. As if the knocking itself is the trigger of the memory, Shelley suddenly remembers that tonight is Halloween and that unannounced visitors aren't necessarily unusual. But there's still something about the sound of that knock, the sound of its insistence that she doesn't like. And she's not very happy 
when mom stands up without a word and starts walking toward the front door. <clears throat> mom hasn't told Shelley to come with her, but Shelley thinks perhaps she better, and she catches up to mom just as she opens the door. Shelley wonders when the street lights went out and why it's only the light of the moon that shines on the two people who are standing on their front porch. For some reason, Mom doesn't seem to recognize them straight away, but Shelley does. They're the men they've just been watching, the men from Slapstick. They're sort of in color now, although they're doing their best to pretend that they aren't. Their various pieces of clothing are either black or white or gray, and their faces are covered with thick white stuff. Shelley supposes the white stuff is makeup, like Mom sometimes wears, but it's powdery and lumpy and looks like it wouldn't feel nice to wear or to touch. Somewhere between where they came from and their arrival at Shelley's front door, the men have learned to talk. Oh, look, Mr. S, says the bigger one, a customer. The little one smiles. Two customers, Mr. S, he says, and his eyes flick from Shelley to her mom and back again. A major and a minor. Standard and economy sizes, as it were, says the first. Full strength and concentrated, says the second, nodding in agreement. Regular and condensed. Condensed, the smaller one says admiringly. Oh, Mr. S., You've hit it precisely, sir. Condensed. Just add water before you throw it in the pan. And then they both look at Shelley and laugh like they've just made a hilarious joke. Shelley remembers what they did to the butcher on TV and doesn't think the joke is very funny. She reaches her hand quietly up toward her mom's, but mom doesn't notice. And Shelley doesn't make a fuss because she doesn't want to draw even more attention from these men. Why isn't mom bothered by these people? Shelley wonders. It isn't only that they're from the TV, but they're grown-ups, and that isn't right at all. Halloween visitors are supposed to be children. It's not, what's the word? Appropriate for grown-ups to be out knocking on people's doors and looking for candy. And Shelley finds their clothes and their makeup scary in a way that isn't fun scary, like the masks and the costumes worn by the neighborhood kids, even the older ones. These men aren't playing, let's pretend. This is who they are. New to the neighborhood, madam, says the bigger one to Shelley's mom, introducing ourselves, as it were. As surprised to be here, says the smaller one, as you are no doubt surprised to see us. The bigger one nods. For what unlikely twist of a benevolent fate, he says, what curious whim of the gods of comic happenstance would have deposited upon your humble and, no offence, madam, singularly unprepossessing doorstep, the likes of us. Shelley hears how proud the big man sounds when he says the likes of us. And when mum doesn't say anything, when neither she nor Shelley clap, the little one cocks his head as if surprised. The uncrowned kings of Oudville, he says, and the newly celebrated sensations of the silver screen. Mr. Sponge, says the big one, gesturing at his friend. And Mr. Scrotum, says the little one, gesturing back. Two who should never be strangers, they say together, and they both bow at the same time. Shelley is all at once very aware of the question that the men have not asked. She doesn't really want to say it for them, but something makes her feel like she has to. Perhaps asking it will make everything go more quickly. Trick or treat, she says. The two men, are they men? Shelley suddenly wonders because... The baggy and grimy white shirt beneath the dusty black jacket of the bigger one seems as if it might be trying to hide mom-sized breasts. Look at each other in response to Shelley's question, and Shelley doesn't like the mutual eager glint that comes into their eyes, 
especially when it's turned back to look again at her and mom. Trick or treat, says Mr. Scrotum, as if trying the words out in his mouth and deciding he likes them. Trick or treat? Oh, a little of both, I'd say, Mr. S. How about you? Smidgen of each, Mr. S, says Mr. Sponge, nodding thoughtfully. Smidgen of each. Though they appear to be addressing each other, their black outlined eyes remain fixed on Shelley and her mom. But first, says Mr. Scrotum, raising a finger, some business. A matter of no pressing urgency, but it never hurts to take care of these things should opportunity deign to present itself. We can't help but find ourselves wondering, lady and small companion, if by any chance our dear friend Nell has been by this way before our own arrival. He twists his head a little trying to look past Shelley and her mom into the house's hallway. Might in fact have left something for us. A jar, says Mr. Sponge, with contents. Mr. Scrotum has only said Nell, but when his friend says jar, Shelley knows exactly who it is that they're talking about. She knows that Nell is short for Eleanor, whose last name is Rigby, and who is the monster in that old song that her mom likes. Shelley knows that Nell Rigby is a monster because Nell Rigby wears a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Shelley stops herself from turning to look at the hall stand. She doesn't want to look because she is afraid that the jar will in fact be there, is afraid that something pale and moist will be floating in its oily water. She doesn't look. She doesn't even twitch her eyes. But Mr. Sponge winks at her anyway, like he knows precisely what she was thinking, like they have a secret now, a special secret that makes them friends. No, I'm sorry, says Mom. No, no one's been here. You're the first tonight. Really, says Mr. Scrotum. I find myself most surprised by that morsel of information. Don't you, Mr. S? Find yourself surprised by that? Surprised, says Mr. Sponge. Not been this astonished since my last plate of steak tartare turned out to be a juggler I'd once worked with at the Palace of Varieties in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Not Rodney Magic Ends Russell, asked Mr. Scrotum. The very same, sir says Mr. Sponge, a most amusing fellow, as you no doubt recall, Mr. S, with a nice line in plate spinning. Tasted like dehydrated camel. Mr. Scrotum looks down at Shelley. First tonight, are we? He says. Not even a quick visit from your friend, Johnny in the dark? Shelley shakes her head, no. I don't know him, she says, and tells herself that's the truth even though, like before, she immediately knows who he means. Mr. Sponge looks at her too. Well, that is indeed passing strange, my little miniature, he says, because he certainly knows you. He turns to his partner, speaks most fondly of her, does he not, Mr. S? Like they're the oldest and dearest of acquaintances, says Mr. Scrotum, but he says it like someone who is already growing bored with that particular topic. And he snaps his fingers by his own face, as if suddenly remembering more important business. He beams at Shelley and her mother, as if whatever comes next is sure to be fun. Here's the thing, Mrs. and Midget, he says, whether they find themselves on the finest stages of the Orpheum circuit or in these most miserable and reduced of circumstances, Mr. Sponge and Mr. Scrotum, held only one truth to be self-evident. He pauses for a second, as if ready to receive guesses. When none are forthcoming, he continues. And what truth is that, Mr. S? That the show, says Mr. Sponge, must go on. That the show must go on, says Mr. Scrotum, and his eyes are alight with joy. 
So what shall it be? He asks, his gaze not leaving Shelley and her mum. A mimetic representation of the sundering of Babylon's Great Wall? Or perhaps the comic dialogue we like to call how the Green Death came to the Palace of the Khan with balloon animals. For we have been princes in different kingdoms, says Mr. Sponge in a different voice. And our memory is as long as our talents are timeless. Though I wonder, Block and Chip, says Mr. Scrotum, as if his partner hadn't spoken, if it might not, after all, be our soft shoe and blackface interpretation of the Stations of the Cross that would most float your boats and bob your barnacles. He raises a questioning eyebrow at Shelley's mum. No, he says, without really giving her time to answer. How about this then? And then he drives his hand through her mother's chest and pulls out her heart. We'll take a little break there. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that Moontown is available on Amazon as an ebook for two ninety nine, and I'm embarrassed to tell you, ashamed for what I did to Earthing Publications, that I think um, even though there are only five hundred copies of the limited edition, I think Paul Miller is still stuck with a few. So if you fancy yourself a nice hardcover, you could also get that. But two ninety nine is an ebook. Um, I want to thank. Jose and Ryan um, for inviting me to be part of the Halloween celebration and uh, once again happy Halloween. <laughs>